Welcome, Faith Church. Hey, good to see you guys today. You look wonderful this morning, and we welcome our online campus. Thank you so much for tuning in today. By the way, if you're in the area and watching online, we invite you to come out to our newly renovated sanctuary, and there's plenty of room, and we love to have you back with us in the house. And if you're out of town or sick or whatever, we welcome you as well. God bless you. Take your Bibles out and turn to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. So good to see everybody here today. Uh, we've been looking at God is. It's been the name of this series, and we've had a couple. Uh, we're all from the book of 1 John. John talks a lot about who God is, who Jesus Christ is. And so, first of all, we looked at God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. And so the good news is Jesus Christ came, the light came into the world to take us out of our darkness, to keep us from going over the precipice precipice of doom and, and destruction because he is light and he brings us out of that. Last week we looked at God as love. Aren't you glad you have a loving heavenly father who loves us and cares about us and then we pass that on to the next generation as we looked at Father's Day and the love of God and what it means in all of our lives and all of our families. When you understand who God is, it changes everything. Today we're going to be looking at God is life. Now let me, uh, how many ever heard, heard the expression, this is the life? Maybe you've said it before. You, get, get your hands up. You heard that expression, this is life. Uh, some of you might be sitting at the beach. You got your lawn chair out there, your, your beach chair out there. You got that umbrella over your head. You've got your Pepsi Cola in your hand, by the way. And you're uh, just enjoying watching the waves come in and out and enjoying the beach and enjoying the sand and marveling at God's amazing creation. And you say, this is the life. Uh, how many beach folks we got in here? Let me see your hand. You let me, some of you have been there already and are going back. And how about, uh, how about the mountain people? You just get up, you're in a cabin somewhere, and you wake up and you see a beautiful mountain out your back window. And in the wintertime, you got a little fireplace right there, and it's cozy and nice. And you say, man, this is the life. This is really the life, right? I think for many in America today, life is all about for them. This is the life if they got a bigger car, bigger house, corner office somewhere, prestige, that job promotion they've always wanted. And for them, that might be their definition of what life is really all about. But here's the problem with all those things. It's always dependent upon your circumstances. And if your circumstances are well, maybe your life's okay. And if you're in the right environment at the right time at the right place, you may make the remark, this is life. But I want to tell you, when you have Jesus Christ, you have life. And life more abundantly. And it is all found in Jesus. God is life. He is life to us. And so it's not dependent upon our circumstances. And even when the storms of life come and the problems and trials and tests come our way, we know that if I have God and I am in Christ Jesus, I have his life. That's what John tells us in this chapter. So let's stand together. Look at 1 John chapter 5. We'll read verses 11 and 12 to begin today. And it says, this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Real life is found in the son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son does not have life. Father, we thank you for your sweet presence in the house today as we've come to worship and glorify and praise your name this morning. And we pray, God, you'll open up the word of God and you'll anoint me as I bring it forth and you'll open up our, to hear what the Spirit has to say to the church today. We'll thank you for your sweet presence and we'll be quick to give you all the praise and the honor and glory in Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless you, you may be seated. Uh, so if, if God is life, how, how can we experience that life that is found in God through the Lord Jesus Christ? Uh, first of all, we have life through our belief. Our belief system determines if I have everlasting life or not. And you say, where do you see that? Look, if you would, at verse number one. Everyone who believes, everybody say believes, believes, believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And so I have that life if I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commandments. In fact, this is love for God to keep his commandments. In other words, our, our measure of our love is measured by our ability to keep his commandments. For, for, and this, his commandments are not burdensome. 
the foundation of all of our Christian life is our belief system. What do you believe about who God is, who Jesus Christ was, what did he come to do, who is he, and what are we talking about today? It all bases and hinges upon that. Now, I wanna tell you, if you're a child of God, your belief system is more than just mental assent. I mean, the, James says in the Bible that even the demons believe in Jesus and believe that he was the son of God, and we know where they're at today. So it's possible to know about God, but if you're a, believe, if you're a child of God and you really believe, it affects the way you live your life. In other words, if I believe God is Lord and I believe he's the son of God and I'm gonna follow and serve him, it changes the way I live my life. And so the word goes on to say that if I I really do love him, I'm gonna begin to obey his commandments and follow him and surrender my life to him as my Lord and as my savior. That's what biblical believing is really all about. Whoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. The litmus test that we love God in verse three says, if we keep his commandments, total surrender to his lordship. The good news is, he goes on to say in verse three that when you know God, his commands are not burdensome. I think the moment we say command, we kind of shut down. I don't want to do what all the Bible tells me to do and I don't wanna live that way and his commandments are hard and all this and that. In fact, it's the very opposite. When you know God, his commandments are not burdensome. They're not a problem. The word burden means weight, to carry a heavy weight. We are not weighted down by obeying God's command at all. In fact, obeying his command is the key to freedom and the key to rest that we can only find in Jesus Christ. Matthew eleven twenty eight says, come to me. All you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. I, I think there's, there's several reasons why God's commands are not burdensome. The first is this, they're not burdensome when we understand that his commands are the best way to live our life. They're, they're for us. He gave us every commandment in the word of God for our own benefit, for our peace and joy and satisfaction and everything else. He gave it for our own benefit blessing in our own fulfillment. It's like, it's like the manufacturer's handbook or, or the owner's manual you get in a car. When you buy a car, you get this real thick owner's manual and it tells you all about how to operate that vehicle, right? And it tells you when to change the oil, uh, what the tire pressure should be. It tells you what those flashing lights on that are going on, on the dashboard that are warning you that something's wrong or something's out of whack. Well, that's kind of what this is for our lives. This is my owner's manual because I'm a son of God and a child of God. He's given you us a manual, a manual that gives us everything that pertains to life and godliness. And so everything I need are contained in the words here. And so it's good for me to follow the owner's manual so my life, my car, doesn't break down, right? God's not some grumpy old man in heaven that gives us these commandments to rob us of our fun. In fact, it's the exact opposite. The commands are for our fullness of peace and fullness of joy. It's for the most purposeful walk we can have in our life. It's the most joyful life. And since God is good, all his commandments are also good. Now, it doesn't mean his commandments are always comfortable or easy, right? But they're always good, and they're given for our very best. Let me give you an example of how this works and why God's commandments are the best. And I'm gonna give you some things that research has shown. You know, God says in his word, don't have sex before you're married. God says in his word, don't just move in together, get married. Make a commitment, make a covenant together, and don't just live together, don't just try it out sexually. And so he writes that in his word, and he's not putting that in his word to stamp out all of our fun. In fact, he says sex before marriage is fornication. It is sin. You didn't know that, it's sin. You say, well, man, that's no fun. God must be a mean God, but they are for our own good. Listen to what research says, and I quote, research suggests that those who wait to have sex until marriage report significantly higher relationship satisfaction, better communication patterns, less consideration of divorce, and even better quality of sex. And I I went on to read the statistics, and this was just taken, uh, I just looked all this up recently. Better satisfaction in marriage, 20% higher satisfaction in marriage if you wait till after you're married to engage in sexual relations. 
22% more likely that marriage will never end in divorce, more marriage stability, and 15% reported higher quality of sexual activity. So God says this not to just say, okay, uh, I, I, I'm just going against everything else and I'm just trying to strip you of all your fun. There's reasons. Relationships improve by waiting to develop to know the other person and who they are and developing good communication skills and to find out who you're marrying. So it's just not about the attraction factor. Less chance of divorce after marriage and also a good practice of self-control, which the Bible says is one of the fruits of the Spirit. So that my wife and I, because we waited till we were married before we had any kind of intercourse, I can trust her when I leave and go out of town for a month and I'm gone on a trip and she's gone and we're not together and all that's because we build that trust into the marriage even before we got married, right? And so God puts this in this because it works the best. Works the best. Not to mention the possibility of unwanted pregnancy and sexually transmitted diseases. God's command are not burdensome, but they're for our long-term good. Amen? Doesn't mean his commands will always be easy, right? Definitely doesn't mean it will be what everybody else is doing at the time, right? But it produces a fruit of righteousness and holiness, which was the Bible said leads to joy. His commands are not burdensome because we've been born again. And when we're born again, I'm given a new heart and the Holy Spirit lives inside of me. Listen to Jeremiah 31 and verse 33. And this is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel. After that time declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and I will write it in their hearts and I will be their God and they will be my people. Listen, apart from the Holy Spirit, it's impossible to obey his commands. But the good news is his commands are not burdensome. Why? Because I got God living inside of me. Because I'm a child of God, his Holy Spirit dwells in me and he gives me the power and the ability to fulfill his commands. Therefore, they are not burdensome all because I'm not doing the heavy lifting. The Holy Spirit is. Isn't that good? God helps us to follow him and to serve him so his commands are not burdensome. With the Holy Spirit within to lead and guide us into all truth, he also gives us the power to obey all of his commandments. There's a third reason. His commands are not burdensome. His commands are not burdensome when we really love God. Because when I really love God, I want to serve him. I want to follow him. I want to live for him. I want to celebrate him. We want to obey and please him. When you really love somebody, it seems little trouble, even through difficulty, to please that person, to want to please that person uh, uh, in, in a marriage relationship, right? I, 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 I work from a place from love, not towards love. So I serve my wife and I try to protect her and I try to provide for her and I try to show her love from a position that I do love her already, not that I'm trying to earn her love. And so it is with our relationship with God. I'm working from a position from love, not towards love. And because God already loves me and I love him, I want to serve him, but I don't have to earn his approval by trying to keep a set of laws and rules and regulations. It's entirely different, your motivation and the, the premise that you are coming from. Uh, there's a story in the Old Testament about Jacob and, and Jacob is fooled by his uncle Laban and his uncle Laban says, you can have my daughter in marriage but first you gotta work for seven years for me and that'll be her dowry and when you get done working for her, I'll give you her to be your wife. And, and there's a verse recorded there. It says in Genesis 29, 20, so Jacob served seven years to get Rachel but they seemed like only a few days to him because of his love for her. And when you love somebody, obeying his commandments is not a burden, it's a joy. Because I love, because I love God. And he tells us right here in 1 John 5, whoever loves God keeps his commandments. Whoever is born of God loves God and therefore he will obey God. Everything we do is from a place of love because we know we love by God. I'm free then to love him back and I'm free to love one another. And that, the Bible says, if we love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, 
and love our neighbor as ourselves. we have literally fulfilled all the commandments with those two. And so, because God loves me and I love him, I serve him in that way. The second reason why, uh, why there's life in Christ is there's life through the victory I have in Christ Jesus. Let's pick it up with verse number four. And it says there, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that has overcome the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. There's that idea of believing must come first. So life comes from believing that Jesus is the Son of God, but second, victory comes through the life in Jesus Christ. If we are born of God, John says we will overcome the world. The idea of anyone being born of God can be defeated, right, by this world was strange to John. He said that, that, that shouldn't be the norm. That shouldn't be the way life is because our victory is found in Christ Jesus. And so if I am in Christ Jesus, I share in his victory. Therefore, I overcome. The new birth is a supernatural event that takes me out of the sphere of this world, right? Where Satan rules and into the family of God. And so, so the spell of the old life has been broken. It's been finished. It has been done. The fascination of this world has lost all its appeal because now I'm a son of God and now I'm a children of the light and now I live in the family of God. Therefore, because of who I am in Christ, I have overcome the world already. It's already been done. It's already happened. So I live out of a position that I am from a position of from victory, I'm not working towards victory. I'm not trying to achieve, I'm not trying to win, I'm not trying to do it in my own strength. No, I already have victory in who I am in Christ Jesus, just like it was with love. The starting point for our faith is a place of victory, not the ending point. Uh, let me see if I can illustrate it this way. If, if, I'm, if I'm gonna race an Olympic runner, uh, how many think I'd win that race? No, I, I'd probably make it 20 yards while he's crossing the finish line 100 yards down the way. I may not even get 20 in before he crosses that finish line. And so there's just no way I can beat an Olympic runner unless I start at the finish line. I'm gonna win every time. Gun goes off, pal, there it is, sorry buddy. <laughs> Run as fast as you want. And so it is, I live my life out of the victory, from the victory I already have in Christ Jesus because what he did for me on the cross. I'm not trying to achieve victory. I'm not trying to win on my own. I, I can't do that. I'm not good enough. I will never succeed. But because of Christ's death and resurrection and my identification with him, I've already won. I've already won. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. When we understand this, then I can begin to walk in spiritual authority because I'm a son of God. I'm covered in his blood. I've already overcome through him. I'm not subject to my own circumstances, even though they are real and even though storms will come and even though at times the pain can be very real, but I'm able to walk in spiritual confidence and authority knowing I already have the victory through Christ Jesus. No matter what goes on around me, we win, we win. Because mm. I already have the victory in Christ Jesus, I don't have to live with comparisons. I'm not comparing myself against anybody else. I am already a child of God. And, and so though you guys who get on social media and you say, oh man, I wish my family was like theirs. My, my life is a mess. I'm not as good as they are and all that. Listen, you are a son of the most high God. Your identity is in Christ not your next door neighbor, not the other person on Facebook, nor do you look at their failures and say, boy, I'm better than they are. Look how they blew it. Look how they failed. Look at their family falling apart. And my, I'm amazing, you know. And so we don't, we don't live in that realm of comparison because I have a new identity. My identity is found in Christ, not in comparisons with anybody else. My victory is in him. Because I walk in victory, because I already have the victory, I also have a future hope. I not only live in victory right now in Christ Jesus, but I will have a future eternal victory forever and ever as I will share heaven with Jesus Christ and all the saints who have gone on before. And so that victory also is ahead of me in the future. Mm, mm, mm. Verse five, overcome. 
the words used, overcome. This is the, who is it that overcomes the world? Only who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Overcomes one of John's favorite words. He uses it many times throughout Scripture, especially in the book of Revelation. When you get to Revelation, he's writing to the churches, and he talks about these seven churches in Asia Minor. A couple of them were doing pretty good. Five of them needed some rebuke. And, uh, but he's, he always talks about, to the one who overcomes, I will grow the tree of life. To the one who overcomes, will eat the hidden manna in me. To the one who overcomes, I will make like a pillar in the house of my God. And he has all these descriptions of, of what happens to those who overcome, to those who make it, to those who hang on to the end, to those who overcome. He's describing, and, and notice when Paul, John says right here, he says, uh, for everyone who, uh, who is born of God overcomes the world. He's not talking about an elite class of believer. We, we, look at, we look at overcoming like it's just for a select few super saints. These are the Navy SEALs in the, in the spiritual realm. The, these are the Army Rangers, right? These are the elite troops, the elite soldiers. They're the overcomers. No, he says, everyone who is born of God, everyone, that's us. Normal, average people like us, we win through Christ Jesus. It's not the super saints. He's talking about here, overcome. It's because of who we are in Christ Jesus. We love our lives from that fact that I have the victory, that I share in that victory that Christ won for me and God is for us. Mm -hmm. Story about a Civil War veteran. He was uh, homeless. He, the Civil War had ended, ravaged the South, uh, really the whole nation. And, and uh, He's going around and he's begging for his life. He has no place to sleep, no place to live, and he's begging for food. And, and he would always go begging and people would, knew who he was and saw him. But he always, he said, but he talked about his good friend, Mr. Lincoln. He said, I'm personal friends with Mr. Lincoln. And he's my buddy and I'm his buddy and can you give me some food? And so, or give me some money or whatever the case was because I'm friends with Mr. Lincoln. And, and one bystander heard him say this over and over again. He says, you say you know Mr. Lincoln, prove it. He says, well, I, well I, I can do just that. He takes an old wallet out of his back pocket and he, and he, and he pulls out a, a, a note. And he says, I, I got a note right here from Mr. Lincoln himself and see right there, I can't read very well, but I, I know that's Mr. Lincoln's signature. And he shows him the crumpled up piece of paper. The spectator looked at it for a moment and said, man, do you know what you have here? You have a generous federal pension authorized by President Lincoln. You don't have to walk around like a poor beggar. Mr. Lincoln has made you rich. And so it is. I think so many times Christians walk around like poor beggars, just trying to struggle to hang on, struggle to survive, struggle to make it somehow, and, 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 we're, and we just don't know who we are in Christ Jesus, but we realize I already have the victory in him. Uh, through my faith I've placed in the Lord Jesus Christ, I walk around as a child of the king. Uh, I'm joint heirs with the Lord Jesus Christ. I have all the inheritance that Jesus is gonna enter into. I enter into that with him. Uh, I win by his resurrection and his death on the cross, I win. Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live not I, but Christ liveth in me. And so that is my victory. My victory is in Christ Jesus. And through that comes my life. Revelation 12, 11, and they triumphed over him, over the enemy, what? By the blood of the lamb, by the finished work of Christ on the cross, and by the word of their testimony. Mm. Blood, the blood, we sang about the blood, and the power of the blood. What can wash away my sins? Nothing, nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ. He covered every sin, he took it away. May we never forget the weight of the cross and the price it took to pay for my freedom in the empty tomb and because Jesus Christ overcame on the cross and he overcame through his resurrection, so do we. And this is they overcome by the word of their testimony. Every one of us have a story if you know Jesus Christ. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was blind, but now I see. I, I, I'm a new person in Christ Jesus. And so if you know the Lord, you have a 
testimony. And when things get rough and things get hard and you feel like maybe I'm not overcoming today and I'm not living up to the fullness of who I am in Christ, I want you to go back and think about your testimony and remember what God has done for you. And it'll change your walk. It'll change your step. It'll change your focus. You'll get it off your problems all around you and you will have it on Christ Jesus because of your testimony, right, about your new life in him. There's life through believing. There's life found in the victory we have in Christ Jesus. And finally, there's life found through the Holy Spirit living inside of us. Let's pick it up with verse number six. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Now, now John writes 1 John to prove who Jesus Christ is. He's gonna prove to us that he's fully man and fully God. He's the one unique God-man. He did not come by water only, but by water and the blood. And then he goes on, and it is the Spirit who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. Now, I'll just pause right there for a moment. Came from water. What does it mean Jesus Christ came from the water? He's referring to his water baptism. Now, I want you to know Jesus Christ goes in the water to be baptized by John. John says, wait, I'm not even worthy to unloose your sandals. Why, I can't baptize you. And he says, this is being done to fulfill all righteousness. And so what he's doing when he goes down into that muddy river Jordan, along with all the other group who are standing around there, who are in their sin, he is identifying with sinful mankind. And so as a man, he identifies with you and I when he went under that water. And he comes out of the water and the Holy Spirit says, God the Father says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, and the Holy Spirit settles on him and anoints him for ministry in the form of a dove. And he says he came by the water and the blood, and the blood of the cross, and the blood of Calvary, and the blood he shed for us. You, you understand, Jesus did not have to die. He didn't have to do that. He says, no man can take my life. He says, I lay it down. And so he lays it down, he hangs on a cross, and there he takes upon every sin upon himself that we have ever done, uh, and he is fully man in this time, and he is identifying with us on Calvary when he dies, and he gives his life for us, right, to save us from our sin. He took our place as a guilty sinner, and he took the punishment we deserved. Hebrews 4 15 and talking about what he did for us. He says, we don't have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way. Listen, you can't tempt God. And yet Jesus was tempted in every way because he was also fully man. You can't kill God. But Jesus died on Calvary because he was also fully man, right? He was tempted in every way We are yet without sin. Jesus was fully man, so therefore he knows when you're going through troubles. He knows when you're grieving. He knows when you're hurting. He knows what it feels like to be rejected, even by those who were the closest to him. He knows what rejection is all about. He knows what pain is all about. He knows what grief is all about. He knows what joy is all about. He knows all those emotions that we feel, all those things that we go through, and yet he did it all without sinning. Wow. But he was also fully God. He never, ever ceased to be God. And even though he laid a aside a lot of his prerogatives when he came down to earth as God to become a man, take on flesh, and dwell among us. He never ceased to be God. He was always the perfect God-man. God-man, right? And so let's, let's look at this testimony. Continue, verse number six again. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and the blood. It is the Spirit who testifies. Notice that word testifies because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify. Now, I want you to get this. John is saying there were three testimonies of the deity of Christ. The water, the blood, and the Holy Spirit. Why is that important? Because in Jewish law, to convict or find anybody guilty or not guilty, it had to be settled in the mouth of two or three witnesses. John says God's already given us three Perfect testimonies. And he says they all work together. Let me go on. 
For there are three that testify the spirit and the water and the blood, and the three are in agreement. We accept human testimony, but God's testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God which, is, which has been given about his son. Wow. Three, testify. Jesus Christ, fully man, but he was also fully God. Because he was fully man, he knows and he understands and, he, and he's with you and he understands you and he can be our comforter. He knows what you go through. He knows what you feel. But because he's fully God, he can fix it. He can fix it. He's got all the power because he's God. And God can do anything. He can do the supernatural. He can fix your broken marriage. He can bring your prodigal kids back home. He can heal your body. He can take your sins away. He can deliver you from your bondage. He can do all those things. He's fully man to identify, to know, but he's also always fully God. Right, right? That's what, that's what John is teaching us right there. Listen to this. Spurgeon says this. A priest was always ordained by sacrificial blood, cleansing water, and oil that spoke of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus also had these three witnesses to his priestly ministry. What a great statement. All, all, anytime you would have a priest, all three things were involved. John is saying, Jesus is our great high priest. The water, the blood, the spirit. They all testify to who he is. Jesus' life and death and the spirit tell us that Jesus is the son of God. And they all speak in perfect agreement. Now listen to me, I want you to, I want you to hear this. The Holy Spirit has already spoken to us in history. He has already testified about who Jesus Christ was. Because remember at his water baptism, the Holy Spirit was there. On the cross, I guarantee you the Holy Spirit was there even though he for a time felt separated from his father. And certainly when you get to the empty tomb, the Spirit breathed upon that lifeless body and brought life into it again. And so the Holy Spirit was there. But I will tell you, he was not just the Holy Spirit working in history, he continues to work today. So he is still testifying to who the Son is God is. He is the one who testifies of Jesus Christ he is the one who what? Leads us into all truth. Who is the truth? Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And the Bible says the Spirit will what? Guide us and lead us into all truth. And the Holy Spirit comes in and testifies in our heart. Listen to Romans chapter 8, verse 15. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you uh, live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought about your adoption into sonship. And by him we cry out, Abba, Father. Look at verse 16. The Spirit himself testifies. What did John say? These three testify about who Jesus Christ was, the water, the blood, and the Spirit. Romans chapter 8, 16, and the Spirit testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. And so that Holy Spirit is still working today. And if you're a child of God, he works inside of your heart and tells you, hey, you're a child of God. You're a son of God. You're okay. You're covered in my blood. How do I know that? I know that I know that I know because I have that inward witness of the ongoing testimony of the Holy Spirit. Come on, come on, somebody. Mm -mm 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 -mm. John's getting old when he writes this letter. These are some of the last three letters he wrote, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. And he's nearing the end of his life. John is probably, by all accounts, intents, and purposes, the last eyewitness of the person of Jesus Christ. John was the one who was there at his death on Calvary, standing in front of that cross with Mary. And John is thinking, I'm, I'm going to be gone. Who's going to testify for Jesus? Who's going to tell the world that he really was the Son of God? Because the last eyewitness to his deity is about to die himself. But John points to a far greater witness. 
He says, his testimony is greater than the testimony of man. His testimony is from God himself. God himself testifies to who Jesus Christ is through the water and through the blood and through the Holy Spirit. Jesus took what we could not take. He did what we could not do. And he made a way where there was never, could never be a way. It would all done through the perfect God, man, Jesus Christ. And whosoever believes in the Son has life. And our life is found in Jesus Christ. God is life. This is the life he's calling us to. It is a life that is led by the Holy Spirit of God who continues to testify to the deity of Jesus. I want to read in conclusion. If we look at verses 10 again, I'll start with 10 and read through 12. Whoever believes in the Son of God accepts this testimony. We've accepted that testimony. If you're a child of God today, you've accepted the testimony of the water and the blood and the Spirit, right? Whoever does not believe God has made him out to be a liar because they've not believed the testimony God has given about his Son. So when you say, I, I, I don't believe that, then you're rejecting God himself, the creator, because you haven't accepted his son, right? And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life. And this life is in the son. And whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son does not have life. What a simple yet powerful truth. Life is found in Jesus Christ. And if you have Jesus Christ, you have light. If you have Jesus Christ, you're living and walking in his love. If you have Jesus Christ, you have hope. If you have Jesus Christ, you have purpose. If you have Jesus Christ, you have direction. If you have Jesus Christ, you have a great high priest who's interceding for us right now. If you have Jesus Christ, you have a God who is always with us, who will never leave us nor forsake us. If you have Jesus Christ, you have a peace that passes all understanding. If you have Jesus Christ, you have the truth. If you have Jesus Christ, you have life. Life, life is in the Son. Life is in Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Keep the lights up if you would. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, you know, everybody that came today, they're here not by accident or chance. But you've drawn them to this place today. Thank you, Lord, for your presence. Thank you for your word. If you're here today and say, Pastor, I haven't invited Jesus Christ to come into my heart and life. I'm not following him, I'm not serving him today, but I wanna give my life to him. I'm ready to receive him as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm ready to become a Christ follower, ready to obey him and live for him. If you're here today and say, I'm ready to give my life to him. Just slip your hand up right now all over this building. I'm gonna see who I'm praying for this morning. You need the Lord, you wanna receive him into your heart, into your life. Don't hesitate. Today's the day of salvation. Today's the day of God's grace. Don't put it off. Yes, God bless you, ma'am. You may slip your hand down. Is there someone else you'd say, pray for me? I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. I need the Lord today. I'm ready to receive him. Anyone else this today? Yes, God bless you, sir. Thank you. Anyone else? You'd say, I need, yes, sir. God bless you. Yes, sir. God bless you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. The Bible says if you believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, you shall be saved. We're going to pray together. I don't want anybody who comes into Faith Church on a Sunday morning to pray by themselves. We want to pray with you. We want to encourage you. We want, to, want you to help, help you verbalize your testimony of your new faith in Jesus Christ. I'm gonna lead us in a simple prayer. I saw four or five, there may have been more I missed that raised their hand and said, I need the Lord. If, you're, if you believe in your heart when you're praying this and, and you're bliss, praying it with your mouth, you shall be saved. That's it, that's it. You're saved, you're born again. You, you've already, you just passed in a moment from life into death. I mean, from death into life. You have everlasting life. But I want the whole congregation to help me. Let's pray together. Dear Jesus, I thank you that you love me. I do believe that you are the divine son of God. And you came to this earth to give your life for me. Thank you for the cross. I thank you that you rose again. I thank you for the power to take away sin. 
So I ask you now to take away all my sins, cleanse me with your blood, add me into your family. And with your help from this day on, I'm gonna follow and serve you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen, amen. Let's celebrate with all those who prayed that for the very first time.